Hello, and a very warm welcome indeed to this latest edition of Talking Germany. And my guest today is an artist and designer who may or may not be typically German. That is something we will have to find out. But he does currently have a very intriguing exhibition on in the German city of Cologne with precisely that title, Typically German? Question mark. Here he is, Rolf Sachs. Thank you very much for coming to Talking Germany today. Great to have you with us today, Mr Sachs. Now, what we do know is that Rolf Sachs is, uh, is typically German to the extent that he hails from an iconographic German family, that is the Sachs Opel industrial family. And his father was no less Gunter Sachs, one of the most flamboyant figures in Germany's post-war period. Well, Rolf Sachs, I've begun by talking about Germany and Germanness, two of our key themes in the show today. And you are often described as Rolf Sachs, the German-born artist and designer. German-born is different from, uh, from German, really. Yeah, no, and uh, actually, technically, it's right. I was born with a German passport. Uh, my mother was French, but uh, my father German. And then uh, when I was uh, in my 20s, uh, I became Swiss because I lived my whole life in Switzerland. Even my father already uh, went before the war, really, mm. to uh, Switzerland. Uh, so technically, it's right, but so I think that my inner soul is German. OK, and how much time have you actually, in your life, spent in Germany? Uh, all lived in, all, in Germany, lived in Germany. Uh, lived in Germany, I would say, all in all, probably 10 years. Well, yeah, not an awful lot. Yeah. OK. Um, You've got several main cultures, but we're going to focus on English and German. Let, let, let's, we're going to talk about words as well and what words express today. So give me your favourite English word that gives us an idea of Englishness and your favourite German word that gives us an idea of Germanness. Probably for the English, it's eccentricity. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> good choice. At least yeah. I'm not wrong there. And probably for the German, uh, precision. Precision. Yes. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think that's a good thing. Me too. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Sir Simon Rattle, the chief conductor, yeah, the principal conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, as you well know, who's English but has lived in Germany for a long time and is due to depart because he said he's leaving the orchestra. He was asked recently this, more or less the same question. He was asked about his German and his, his relationship to the German language and asked for his favourite word. And the word he said is going to be important to us today, I think. He said, Sehnsucht. Yeah, and it was interesting because, I mean, that translates for our audience, we should say immediately, as yearning, mm -hmm. but it has a different feel. And so Simon Rattle said, uh, he said, Sehnsucht explains all good music. The word yearning explains all good music. Uh, music. Now, the reason why I've gone into all this is because you have been, have, have been quoted as saying, we Germans have a Sehnsucht, a yearning, for our native soil. Almost sounds like 19th century language, sir. <laughs> and it probably is. Ah, yes. And it is something which uh, came from the end of the 19th uh, century. Mm -hmm. And uh, this period, of course, uh, the early 19th century was still very strict in Germany. And uh, everything was not very flexible and liberal. Mm -hmm. And uh, then towards the end, we have uh, especially the writers who started the Romantic period. Mm -hmm and which very much had to do with Sehnsucht. Yeah. They were yearning Sehnsucht. for Sehnsucht. Yeah. <laughs> they were yearning for freedom of mind, of uh -huh. thought, uh -huh. which was then a very sort of rosy and uh, not so... It was boundaryless. Mm -hmm. And probably all the movements we have, even the 60s, we tried to shatter our boundaries, yeah? Mm -hmm. To find new ways, to find a sexual revolution, mm -hmm. to find the thing. And that uh, is something which happened very strongly in the 19th century, where I think we had a lot of Sehnsucht. Okay. Sehnsucht, a wonderful, wonderful German word. You've had your first impressions there from Rolf Sachs. Here is more. <laughs> Rolf Sachs' London studio is full of amusing items. Here a chair made from a shopping cart. There a lamp shaped like a candle and one that's also a table. Rolf Sachs creates furniture that's both humorous and profound and as minimalist as possible. He exhibits his design and art objects at shows from Milan to New York. The limited edition pieces fetch up to 45,000 euros. Zax studied economics and trained as a banker. 20 years ago, he opened a design studio in London. 
The 58-year-old's home is decorated with his own works, as well as classic furniture from the 20th century, alongside items like an installation by Swiss artist duo Fishley and Weiss, and a homemade refrigerator. The son of German playboy Gunter Sachs, Wolf Sachs can easily afford to have such exclusive taste, and he doesn't even really need to work. As a member of the fourth generation of a family of German industrialists, Rolf has inherited millions. His father, Gunter Sachs, was post-war Germany's first really cool celebrity, a cosmopolitan dandy. Young Rolf grew up with his grandmother, Eleanor von Opel. Gunter, with his laid-back elegance and extravagant lifestyle, became a legendary representative of the jet set always surrounded by beautiful women. Rolf's stepmother, for a time, was French actress Brigitte Bardot. Rolf's father, Gunther, grew up in Switzerland and studied mathematics and economics. In 1958, Gunther's father, Rolf's grandfather, committed suicide and Gunther took over the family business. But he loved art, so he sold the company and invested his inheritance in contemporary artworks. Andy Warhol was made famous in Germany by Gunter Sachs. But Sachs didn't just collect art, he made a name for himself as a photographer. Rolf Sachs shared his father's passion for art. The designer and artist also creates stage sets. His trademark is a knack for putting things in unfamiliar juxtapositions. As a Swiss citizen with German-French roots, Rolf, along with his Iranian-born wife Mariam and their three children, feels at home in multicultural London. But he's also in Germany regularly, visiting the Sachs ancestral home in Reschenau, Bavaria, where he would one day like to be buried under a spruce tree. And today, he's our guest on Talking Germany, Rolf Sachs. Well, well, what a what a guest, what a life! Uh, so many fascinating images. Um, a little bit of gossip to begin with, though. You you hung out when you were a lad, when you were a, a small boy, with quite a lot of quite famous people. In it, you, you were in the same rooms as these people. Uh, was Andy Warhol one of them? Andy Warhol was one of them. I met Andy Warhol when I was uh, once a kid, mm -hmm. and then later when I was 22 or 23. I'm even in his memoirs, yeah, which is really? quite fun to be. <laughs> yeah, someone once told me, oh yeah, because one night I remember I was in uh, legendary Studio 54, yeah. and uh, there was a friend of mine who was hanging out with Andy Warhol, and then as uh, he knew my father, he immediately said, ah, Rolf, come on. And then we went into the back VIP room, which was, of course, at the time, I thought it was quite a normal moment. It is, of course, only <laughs> over time that it became a night with the famous Andy Warhol. And what, what impression did, when you met him as a youngster, yeah, yeah. what impression did Andy Warhol make on the, 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 the young, the very young Rolf Sachs? To tell you the truth, not that much. I mean, it's like, you know, you have a lot of artists, you have a lot of yeah. uh, things, and it's a whole persona which grows over time and over the yeah. years, yeah? And at the time, you don't even have immediately the feeling, ah, oh, he's amazing. For instance, I met Kurt Jürgens. I thought he had a much more, because he had this vibrant voice. Yes. And you saw him in movies, yeah. yeah, which was, of course, much <laughs> more impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, but going right back to the very beginning, you had what you have called a very German up bringing and when you say that it doesn't forgive me for this but it doesn't sound very nice and uh, you know what it is nice if there's a lot of love and heart involved mm. if uh, that wouldn't be the case then it wouldn't be quite that nice but otherwise it just means that life was very regulated mm. it had discipline mm. and I think that is something uh, you know most people who went through that upbringing mm. are very thankful over time mm -hmm which could be translated as your childhood was there was love and it was a, and there were interesting things happening but it was something that you survived as much as that you enjoyed uh, absolutely and then i went anywhere with eight into boarding school which yeah. is then of course uh, great fun because you can do a lot of silly things with lots of friends i myself i went off to boarding school at 13 and yeah. uh, and, uh, and it was uh, and it was uh, you you start designing your own life very early in life yeah uh, you came from this uh, business and industrial family you went off and studied exactly what uh, I studied, uh, started math and then I did business administration yeah. in America. 
And uh, this was obviously also somehow a family obligation, which wasn't really doctrined upon me by my father, mm -hmm. but uh, perhaps on, on, on myself, because I, you know, I felt responsible. I'm the oldest brother. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it was very interesting, and it is something which still interests me. Yeah. And I had my creative soul in me. Mm -hmm. And anyway, nobody can take that, and uh, you can't learn it. When you, you talk have about it or your, not. Yeah, when you talk about your creative soul, my feeling is that when you'd, co when you'd completed your studies, the idea was that you were going to go into business and banking, yeah. but you didn't because, and we're going to go back to that word again, Sehnsucht. There was a yearning in you to do something different. Yes. Describe that yearning. I think that I went actually into business in the beginning and I was working in our family uh, office, but uh, I was always, uh, you know, somehow creating uh, in my mind. And then uh, I got invited to do exhibitions and so on. So it is slowly, yeah, this Sehnsucht, mm -hmm. yeah, which uh, probably wins over rationality. Yeah. Probably a very good thing too. And when yes. we look at your works of art, we're going to be looking at some more in the, in the current exhibition, but we've seen quite a few already. Uh, the, I asked myself the question, does Rolf Zaks have a concept of art or are you more a sort of a pragmatist who goes from object to object and, and, you know, and adjusts? I think that I am a conceptual artist and thinker. Mm. My studio is a lab. Mm. I don't like to work just with one discipline. Yeah. And I think my strength lies in finding different pockets mm -hmm. with new interesting uh, concepts. Mm. And I even could imagine that someone else then picks up certain concepts. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, goes deeper with it, mm -hmm. yeah, digs deeper with, yeah. Uh, with it. So it's a little bit like, I don't know, Lichtenstein who always did his comic strips and his dotted paintings, which are fantastic, and he went to the depth of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I like uh, to be a little bit, uh, have a wider range yeah. of uh, mediums to work with and ideas to work with. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably uh, someone would say, ah, no, it's better to focus only on one idea. I think my strength is, uh, you know, to find uh, different uh, ways where you can... OK, and that's, very much, that's very much reflected in the work you yeah. do, that's for sure. Uh, just one more point, because uh, you're talking about how you work, where you work at this point in time, and you work in one of the international art capitals, which is London, you move about a lot. Uh, th we, this is a time, a phase in art history, where German art, German visual art, not, ju not just, you know, the painting and what have you, and con concept conceptual art, but photography as, as well. German visual art is hot. Yeah? Yeah. Why? Um, I think that over the 20th century, art has sort of moved from the south or even from the Catholic countries, France, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, towards the north, uh, Germany, England, mm -hmm. and Holland also, if you look at the design world especially. And if you look today, there's no major French painter that where in the beginning of the 20th century, we know that the most uh, important uh, country in France, or the omnipresent country, mm -hmm. was obviously um, France with Picasso and Matisse and all the Impressionists. Everything else. Everything <laughs> else. And today there's none, one important, and if you look at the uh, German second half of the 20th century, you have uh, Beuys, Richter, Polke, Rosemarie Trockel, Baselitz, and it's endless. And then uh, you it's spoke a long, about... It's impressive uh, list. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you have all the Becher mm -hmm. uh, pupils, yeah, yeah uh, Gursky, which is uh, Gursky, Ruff, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, all of them and uh, which is, uh, you know, very, imp uh, really very impressive. Mm, mm. <laughs> Rolf is getting all, uh, all annoyed about the, the gnomes all over the place on, on his works of art, yeah? Yes, Plotting I didn't realise that, yeah, yeah, somehow the camera team put these little gnomes in. Oh, yeah, the little Gartenzwerge, which are not really part of the... So we're thing. going to introduce another German word here, which, is, uh, which will be familiar to everybody, which is kitsch. Yes. Yeah. And of course, uh, the gnome, uh, as uh, also the one I've shown in the piece, it's a little subtile because I had it sculpted out of coal. Yeah, we might get to see the little fellow in just a second. Uh, okay, I'm not sure. We're uh, going to look at yeah. one or two of those works more closely. Okay. But first of all, I, I, I mentioned it twice already. The exhibition is called Typical, typi mm, Typically German, Typisch Deutsch, yeah, yeah. Uh, with a question mark. What's the function of the question mark exactly? 
I think the question mark is basically a show like this is something subjective. Yeah, mm. it is not an academic work. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's something how I see it. And, uh, you know, a lot of Germans might identify with it, and might not identify with it. And mm. that's why I think the question mark was important. If I wouldn't have had that, then it would have been, it should have been a more academic work. Yes. Okay. Um And one of the inspirations for you to begin to think about staging this exhibition uh, was encapsulated in a sentence that I have it, a quote from you. You said, living in London, I have for some time seen Germany's standing in the world changing for the better. That's interesting. Can you explain? Tell us more there, because that's important. Basically, England always uh, had a very bad perception of Germany. Mm. Of course, since the Third Reich, and one had the feelings very often in the papers, the articles that sell are sex and the Third Reich. Yeah. And um, I have seen uh, a subtle change. Uh, unfortunately, in school, it is still only the Third Reich one is taught about uh, German history, mm -hmm. uh, as my own children uh, tell me, and I know a lot of German ambassadors. It's absolutely true, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah are yeah. trying to battle this yeah. uh, because there's other things about uh, Germany. Then there's a very interesting book which came out by an English journalist, Peter Watson, called The German Genius. Former guest on the show. Yeah. Oh, fantastic, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a wonderful yeah, he's uh, thing. He became a very good uh, friend. It's a very interesting book. And it shows really the depth of uh, Germans' uh, contribution to the world over the last uh, two to three centuries. It's sort of the other side of the story. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's mm. a cultural history. Yeah. It has no political attitude towards us. Of course, one could see the political drain which Germany had to suffer if one wants to because of the Third Reich, yeah. uh, which was uh, on the long run uh, certainly... Uh, very unfortunate for Germany. Yeah, total disaster, without, yeah. A, without a question. Uh, okay, let's have a look at one or two of the, of the works from the exhibition. Maybe you can uh, give us an idea of what we're looking at. We're going to begin with, the, 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 we're going to go back to that word, Sehnsucht, yearning. Yeah. Uh, that, Rolf, tell us what we've got there. Here we have uh, a scale, and on the one side we have a heart sculpted out of marble, and on the other side a brain. The classical thing between emotion and rationality. Yeah. Uh, here, as we have at the German exhibition, it is slightly tilted towards the rational side <laughs> uh, because uh, Germans are probably more rational yep. and uh, yes, they're very conscious. Does that, does, does that apply to you as well? Are you just you're tilted just a little bit more to the rational side? Are you or are you a very I think that I am probably fellow. a little bit uh, more tilted towards the emotional side, but this is of course all to my artistic soul. Okay. Next work, yeah, that we're going to have a look at is called Ausfahrt. Again, a German word, explain. Yes, uh, Ausfahrt is, of course, the German Autobahn is something which is uh, world-renowned. We are the last country where one is allowed to speed for good or for bad. <laughs> yeah. And the Ausfahrt sort of represents it as a piece I did already a few years ago, and I use it as a the studio dining uh, table. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, it's uh, something, I think, which uh, represents that part, also including the whole kind of car manufacturing and so on. In it. Exactly. Very, very German. Ausfahrt means uh, motorway exit. Aha! Now we've got another... another uh, we've, got some, we've got some garbage bins there. Yes, yeah. uh, the we've Germans got... are known that uh, they uh, sort of uh, separate the garbage uh, very meticulously. Yes. And, uh, Meticulous so I... is the word, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and it's... Very, I would call it meticulously, but responsibly. So it is somehow, I think the whole uh, population has a great response, feels very responsible towards the environment. We will be the first country to shut down nuclear mm -hmm. uh, reactors. I'm not for it. I think we can't really afford it for the moment. On mm -hmm. the long run, it mm -hmm. is probably a good thing. And then uh, I did these dustbins and on it, uh, I wrote then uh, words uh, which one better should uh, throw away, like uh, envy or bureaucracy. And, mm. uh, It's an interesting concept. Yes. Uh, it, it, it begs the question, however, because um, waste separation, I mean, you've said it yourself, Germans are good at it, it's a good idea. So, what, I mean, why are you mocking that? What's wrong with it? Because, uh, you know, it's the right thing to do. 
it is absolutely the right thing to do, and I'm not mocking it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm trying to add a little humor to it. Yeah, yeah? Uh -huh. by saying a little bit what uh, you know to throw uh, throw away. It was a great discussion point in my thing. We said, no, come on, you're always positive. Well, why do you put this negative thing? I think it is quite humoristic, and it has worked. It is in front of the museum, and everybody stops and photographs it and puts their envy in the envy bin. Exactly. <laughs> um, I'd like to. We're talking about Germanists. I'd like to talk to you just a wee little bit about your father. Yeah, because people outside Germany, I mean, well, many do. They realise that he was such a he was such a signal figure, such a symbolic figure in Germany, and very important for that in that post-war period, the fifties going into the sixties, into the seventies. Why was he so important? What was if he was a symbolic figure? What did he stand for? I think uh, that he stood for uh, somehow great freedom. Yeah, and the one thing he dared as a German to go out and live just 13 years after the war in Paris. Mm. And uh, he was then uh, a young man full of life, mm. uh, which had the means to live a little bit uh, differently. And uh, perhaps also the looks, the interest, the intellect and style. Mm. And uh, with that... Uh, it was quite a package. And it was quite a package. <laughs> And uh, he had the tendency to uh, have a very beautiful, a very uh, secure hand for beautiful uh, ladies. And uh, yeah, <laughs> so he became an... That is also a talent. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and he became, uh, you know, an iconic uh, figure and started a very, very interesting life. Okay. Just permit me one more question, not about your father now, but to go back onto the philosophical level. Uh, we... we we talk about uh, the, the whole issue we're addressing here is what is Germanness? What is at the es what is the essence of Germanness? Why do we? Wh why should anybody care? Why is that important? I mean, we don't talk about Russianness or Brazilianness or Americanness. We, we we talk a lot about Germanness. Is that just? Is that because of the difficult history and the terrible things that Germany did, or is there more to it than that? I think there is probably more to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things is certainly that. Uh, I wanted to help a little bit for uh, an international public to understand also the German. And we are precise, and we are very punctual, and we are very clean. And people were laughing about it perhaps in past years. Now they don't anymore because there's a necessity for everybody to be precise, to be able to compete in the world, or let's say, to withstand in this compet competitive world. And on the other side, we are this land of Dichter und Denker. Mm. We have this wonderful, beautiful, romantic, po poetic, and thinkers, yeah. poetic uh, mm. side, uh, the thinker side, the philosophical sides to, of things, which are sort of two contrarian movements mm. in one soul. Okay. <laughs> I always tell people that if they want to understand Germany, they need to understand that there are two Germanys, at least in one respect, and that is what we've just been talking about, which is religion. There's, there's Protestant Germany and there's Catholic Germany. Do you agree? Um, I think uh, this is certainly the case, and I think that uh, Luther probably influenced the whole of Germany mm -hmm. um, with his uh, reform. I think we moved at the time from sort of moral guilt to uh, guilt if one isn't uh, working hard, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, getting which... near to the Protestant work ethic here, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, this became a typical German work ethic, mm -hmm. industriousness, mm -hmm. yeah, punctuality. Mm -hmm. A lot of these things come out of that time. Mm -hmm. Probably also the German soul was uh, a great sponge to absorb this, mm -hmm. yeah, and it. Uh, fitted them uh, quite nicely. You, you, you're very lucky, you Germans, because most most British people and most English people, I should be careful, most English people in, the, in their in their own perception of themselves, they feel, they think they have a mind and they have a body. End of story. And you Germans, you have a mind, a body, a heart, a soul, and what you also call a Geist, yeah, a spirit. You've got all of these things inside you, yeah. Yeah, we have a Geist, and uh, that is something, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it is probably something, uh, you know, different, something extra, mm -hmm. yeah? But uh, on the other side, you have something which is perhaps much more light-hearted. Mm -hmm. The English have spirit. Spirit. Yeah? Yeah. Perhaps mm -hmm. in German we could say 
Biss. Biss. Bite. Yes. But, mm -hmm. you know, in a sort of humoristic uh, life attitude way. Yeah. Okay. This sort of uh, eccentricity, mm -hmm. which uh, the English have, uh, we are unfortunately missing. Okay. If, if the Protestant northern bit of Germany and the Reformation in general led to the Protestant work ethic, a very important aspect of Germany becoming a successful industrial culture and all that kind of stuff, if there are two Germanys, north and south, and there are two different aesthetics, which is quite close to where you're coming from, from the world of art, which of those two aesthetics are you part of? I am very clearly uh, part of the northern aesthetics. Uh, uh -huh. I have. I thought you were going to say the south. That's interesting. Yeah. No, uh, mm. I think uh, Ecken and Kanten. Uh, although that uh, I lived in Munich, mm. and I find Ecken Munich a beautiful town. What are Ecken and Kanten? Um, Ecken and Kanten. It's uh, sharp edges. You have sharp edges. And uh, yeah. yes, I like sharp, uh, sharp edges. You like I don't lines. Know if I you like lines and corners. Yeah, yeah, I like lines and corners. And geometry. I don't I like geometry. Mm. And I don't like decoration. Mm. And the southern part of Germany is more decorative. Yeah. yeah and the northern part is a little bit harsher. I see. Uh, and, and we've got to get back to where we came from because we were talking about Martin Luther. Yeah, yes. Martin Luther. Uh, the report suggested, and I think quite plausibly, that Martin Luther has a or had a sense of humour. Do you agree? I think that probably if one pushes work as an ethic, mm -hmm. that work is certainly something which is very good for the soul. And if your soul is healthy, hopefully it will also be able to develop humour. That was a no. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite definitely a no, yeah? I don't know, yeah. I was quite happy about my theory. <laughs> Uh, I have written down, I, this I think is Martin Luther's best line, it's, uh, if we're talking about uh, humour, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to judge his religious uh, uh, sayings and what have you. Uh, Martin Luther said the following, if I'm not allowed to laugh in heaven, I don't want to go there. That's good. I think that's very good. Yeah. Yes. You have a sense of humour, yeah? Where yes. did you get it from? Um, I don't know, possibly, uh, you know, I could search my French side. Ah. You as an Englishman, you would say, you would probably be doubtful. So, uh, you know, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, I got something from your country. Oh, yeah. We're very good at irony. <laughs> very good at irony, yeah? That yes. should have helped you living in, 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 in the UK, yeah? Yeah. OK. Uh, Rothschild isn't only at home in Germany and Britain. He also spends a lot of time in Switzerland. Uh, one reason he's very involved in winter sports, he always has been because it's something that he grew up with. Uh, he's even been described as alpine obsessed, yeah? His big passion is the legendary Cresta run, more about that later, uh, which I think he still goes down uh, right up to now. We'll find out in a second. Uh, but let's hear from Professor Metin Tolan of Dortmund University, who's going to tell us from a scientific perspective uh, about the kinds of pressure that build up in a typical Bob run. Bob's letters reach speeds of up to 150 kilometers per hour. And in the turns, they can be subjected to five Gs, or five times the Earth's gravitational force. It's an extreme situation for the drivers. But what else is at work? To see how a bobsled goes down a mountain, we first have to consider all the forces that affect it. If this is the mountain the bobsled travels down, and here we have the bobsled itself, with its runners, then there are different forces affecting it. First we have gravity, which is pulling the sled downward. But different forces are working against gravity, such as the friction of the runners, just normal friction. The second important force opposing gravity is air drag, and that depends on how aerodynamic the bobsled is, for instance. But air drag is also the reason why the bobsled goes faster, the heavier it is. You can see that as demonstrated with this experiment. The heavy wooden ball is much faster than the strips of paper. The reason for that is air resistance. We can prove that by pumping the air out of the tube. And as we see, suddenly the heavier ball falls as quickly as the lighter paper. But Bob's letters also have to be athletic. So at the end of the day, it comes down to training, training, training. <laughs> you do this kind of thing. 
I love it. On a regular basis? On a regular basis. What's it like? I'd be terrified. I mean, I'd love to go. I'd love to go down the Cresta Run. I'd love to go down a Bob Run, but like, I'd be frightened. It is the absolute adrenaline rush. Yeah. No, it is a wonderful uh, feeling. It's, of course, uh, I'm very, very lucky to have been sort of brought up in St. Moritz. Mm -hmm. And uh, my whole family has done always the Bob Run and the Cresta Run. And uh, I'm an avid supporter of it. I'm also president of the Bobsleigh Club and vice president of the Cresta uh, Club, uh, which are two wonderful institutions uh, which the English invented. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're quite good at inventing that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, the, 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 um, the Cresta Run is, I mean, I, I've said I would be frightened. Would I, would, would I be right to be frightened or is it dangerous? Because we, we've heard there about the pressures on this, uh, you know, on these, when you get in one of these chutes going down a mountain, yeah? It, it certainly takes uh, some guts to do it, mm -hmm. yeah? One would be a little frightened. It is not that dangerous that, uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, fatal accidents uh, in the year. We practically had only two in 140 years and they're more like oh. freak. Accidents, mm -hmm. yeah. you have more even just crossing the road. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it is a very uh, thrilling thing. You have to, you know, have uh, the courage to do it and you risking a little bit, uh, perhaps some uh, broken bones in the fingers or in the thing. And we had actually okay. a very, very British... <laughs> I thought you were going to present me your finger. A very <laughs> British attitude, for instance, one of our president, yeah, yeah. Lord Bledisloe, he went down and he actually lost the tip of his finger because he went over it with the run. Mm -hmm. And he came back to the club at 11 after they tied it up and so on. And then uh, so everybody came and, oh, good God. <laughs> Uh, Lordy, are you okay? And so on. And he said, oh, no, no problem. It wasn't the trigger finger. <laughs> very British So very, attitude. so very British. That is the stiff upper lip. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, what, inter what interests me most of all about all this, and it's not got directly to do with what we've been talking about, is that uh, you have all of this in your blood because you grew up with it. You, you've, you've intimated that. And you had a particularly, in if I understand correctly, and I really want to know, you had a particularly interesting instructor when you were a young man. You were very, very fortunate there. Uh, instructor, you mean as a teacher or a Cresta? On the toboggan run. On the toboggan run, yes. I'd, uh, yes, my first teacher was Nino Bibbia, yeah. who was a very famous uh, Italian Swiss nationalized who was uh, Olympic champion of uh, 1948. And uh, yes, he passed away, I think, two years ago really? now. Yeah. yeah, but he was, of course, an iconic figure. And you were, as a 13-year-old, you were, he took you aside and... Uh, I was and a 13-year-old, and uh, I think it's basically my father who asked him, ah, yeah, can't you be the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, my son's coach? Uh, so it was, of course, a great honour. Good for you. And another way in which you are an extremely fortunate fellow, I have to say, is this house you've got, this holiday house or whatever you're going to call it. It's, it's a bit too grand to be a holiday house in St. Moritz. Share that with us. Um, yeah. That was in uh, 1928, which was actually planned as the first Winter uh, Olympics. They built in two months a very simple uh, sports pavilion with a tower which then was used as the sort of uh, Olympic stadium for the officials changing cabins. The Olympic flame was on the tower and it was a derelict building in St. Moritz and uh, one day I had the idea where I could make my personal house out of it. And uh, after a seven-year battle, I managed to do it, restored it, and uh, it is now my very proud family home. Wonderful. Okay, Rolf, at the end of the show, we have a quick Talking Germany quiz uh, where you get alternatives. Are you a nationalist or an internationalist? Internationalist. Okay. Do you prefer laughter or tears? Laughter. Mm. Summer or winter? Winter. Yeah. Yearning, this is the big philosophical one now. This is the most important question on the show. Do you prefer yearning or fulfillment? Fulfillment. Really? Yes. You want to get it, what you're yearning yes. for? Sometimes just Somehow. yearning and on its own is you enough know, and a wonderful too, thing. I'm too passionate for that. Scarves or ties? Scarves. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your most typical German characteristic? Um, I am probably... I'm probably quite precise. Okay. And um, uh, am I more typically English or more typically German now that you've been looking at me with your eagle eye for 45, sec uh, for 45 minutes? I think uh, that you slowly uh, Germanized Anglophile. 
slowly Germanized Anglo. That's interesting. Thank you very no? much for that. It that goes for okay. both yeah, yeah, directions. That's not bad. Yeah. That's not bad yeah. <laughs> okay, that's your lot with the thoughtful and very charming Rolf Sachs, a great guest. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, come back next week. Bye bye. Tschüss. <laughs>